Let me tell you what we're going to do this morning. We're going to start in Galatians, and then um, what I felt like the Lord wanted um, us to do this weekend is to look at the character attributes of the Father as we see God revealing himself in the Bible. So we're going to look at attributes in the Old Testament, and then, then in companion with that, we're going to see the face of Christ reflecting the attributes of the Father in the New Testament. Okay, so you're going to be doing a lot of turning. Okay, so anyway, let's look at this first scripture, um, Galatians 5, 4, which kind of sets the tone. Because you are sons, daughters, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying Abba, you know, that's that word daddy, crying daddy father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Now, that's the heart of what we're doing is God presents himself as Abba, as Daddy. And I pray that as, as we journey through the scriptures this morning, that you would um, find those areas of your heart that just really rest and celebrate Daddy, but then um, let yourself also be ministered to as the Holy Spirit reveals those elements of your heart that struggle with Daddy. That in a sense that maybe you see elements of the Father and it frightens you in a way that is not of the Lord. And so let the Holy Spirit minister you because the heart of God is that he presents himself as daddy. And, and so what I have the honor of doing this morning is let me tell you about our daddy as we look at the word. Let's look at these two scriptures. Let's, let me do a couple things. So look on the screen um, because a seeming paradox as we study this. Um, Jeremiah 29, 13 Look up here. It says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Okay, everybody got that? So you'll seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Now look at this in Job, and, which is a seeming contradiction. Can a man by searching find God? Go back to Jeremiah again. Look at this. On the screen, go back one. You'll seek me and find me, and the key things when you search for me with all your heart. Notice now in the Job scripture, one more time. Can a man by searching find God? What this scripture intimates and the way it's put together in the Hebrew is that this is an academic search. This is an intellectual search. This is a search based on the efforts of man. You know, the Bible says everything about the Lord is we love because he loved us first. And God is the initiator. God has no ego to bruise when he reaches out to people that want to kill him and hate him, right? And so the whole heart of what's going on is, is that the Lord purposes in saying that just academics, that's why you see so many people, you see the, the, the foundation of our nation on the East Coast where most of our Ivy League schools were founded in Jesus' name, no longer use the name of Jesus. But they were all Christian organizations because at some point they detached their heart from their study and they became intellects. So one love, one of the things that we constantly battle as we put out the word is that we put out the word, I think, you know, from Wax to Arsha Larson and myself and others, we're privileged to be here, but we study our brains out so that we put out the word not only this way, but we filter it through the heart. Because our God is personal. And academics and study, you know, you don't, we don't want you to just know about God. We want you to know him intimately because that's his heart for you, right? So this is not a contradiction. Can man search and find God? The answer is no. But if you seek him through your heart, if you just go here, no. But if you go heart search, he'll do this. So check this out. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, God acknowledges this and says this. For God, who said, let light shine out of the darkness, right? So light shines out of the darkness, made his light shine where? In our hearts. You notice that? But look why. To give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory. Did you catch that? So understanding of the mind must be processed through the heart where God chooses to shine. That is the active process of God's revelation. He beams it to our heart. He goes up there. We're renewed by the transforming of our mind, but it always, always heart issues. And that's the true academic in Christ is one that says, Lord, my heart is yours. Do you receive that? Okay, so made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed where? In the face of Christ. So as we look at these attributes in the Old Testament, what we're going to see is fulfillment 
and realization of God walking on the earth as we see the different facets of Christ himself as he displays everything about Abba Father. That's wonderful. And the tandem of that, that's why we'll, 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 we'll go ahead and get into this right now. So um, the first one, I'm turning your Bibles to Isaiah 64, verse 8. And how this works is as I throw out the scripture, look up on the screen and you'll see the title that we're going to talk about. Avi or Abba, the everlasting father, and we find that reference in Isaiah 64, verse 8. Go ahead and take your time and get there. If you're at Psalms, keep going, right? Keep going and um, go through um, a bunch of those little guy books, and then you'll get to um, the first big prophet, Isaiah. Best friend at One Love, table of contents. Okay, no shame, just go there. And um, Isaiah 64, 8. After this, we're going to go into Genesis, and we'll kind of power through, so you'll just be turning, 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 okay? But look at what it says. But now, O Lord, you are our Avi, or Abba, Abba Father. We are the clay, and you are potter, and all of us the work of your hand. Now, this, the context of the scripture is Isaiah is, is writing and looking back prophetically at a time where the God was guiding Israel through the wilderness 40 days, 40 years after they had escaped Egypt. And it talks about the father, the papa's heart, as he would lead them and guide them, and they would be really excited and grumble, grumble, grumble. Grumble about the food, grumble about the water, grumble about the clothes, grumble, grumble, grumble. And, you know, at some point, even Moses and people are saying, gosh, we may, what do we do? here. They're just grumbling, grumbling, grumbling all the time. But we see the heart of God that endures through the grumble never discards the children of God. And that Papa's heart that is willing to endure not because he has to, but because he wants to. That daddy part that um, embraces every aspect of what it is about your kids. Look at this scripture again one time. Think about the picture that God gives of himself. We are the clay and you are our potter. Think about the privilege of fatherhood. It's the privilege to mold and shape someone. To set path towards. To determine. God has a design. Right? God has a design for you. Before I formed you, I knew you, it says in Jeremiah 1. So we have the parenting privilege is to discover the design of your kids and to raise them the way God would want them to be. Not in your image, but in his image. That's the challenge of parenting. And a lot of times the parenting as we get older is to lovingly get out of his way, to surrender the center stage to them. And so we see the heart of God coming out and saying that, what does daddy say? Um, we say, daddy, you are, we are the clay, you're the potter, and all of us are the work of your hand. We acknowledge that we come from you. And that's the heart of saying, you're daddy. Where is the face of Jesus in this? Isaiah 9, 6, it'll be on the screen, but write this down. You know, what I do for mine is that for the, Galatia, the Isaiah thing, I write down just the face of God. I just write down Isaiah 9, 6. Look at this prophetic point. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Abba, right there, Prince of Peace. So Isaiah then points to Jesus as being the Eternal Abba, to being Daddy. Now, John 14, 7 and 9, also on the screen. If you had known me, Jesus responding, you would have known my father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip, um, um, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the father. Now, that last part of the scripture really epitomizes the heart. Because what Jesus invites us to look at, dear ones, he says, you know what? Look at me and see Abba. You want to understand the heart of God. Sometimes people tell us, you know, I, don't, I can't get into God because, you know, it's just like it's so abstract, so whatever. And, and how do you re relate to a personal God? Well, look at a personal Jesus. Look at his claims. That's a very bold claim. He says, you want to know my Papa? Watch me. 
Watch me. I act like my papa. I talk to my papa, everything about him. That's why the organized church at the time freaked out on Christ because he would go into the temple and say, you know what? That's not the way my father's house is supposed to be. You've turned it into a den of thieves. You know, or he would, he would go to the guys and, and they would judge him because he's sitting with the sinners. He goes, my papa loves these people. At one point, the Lord's saying, what have you done? How, why are you people so afraid of my dad? Because he's been radically misrepresented by those who have an intellectual connection to God, but their hearts are far from him. That's why God says, I will shine my knowledge into your heart and keep letting that resonate with you throughout the thing. So we see the father saying, I'm a papa, I'm a daddy, but he doesn't come and flex like this or go like this in the midst of it because he's like, I'm not going to hurt you. And you're, oh my gosh. I'm not mad. And you're yelling louder. Right? How convincing is that? I'm not leaving, as you say, as you drive in your, away in your car, right? I'll be right back. No. So Jesus says, he says here, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So he fulfills the prophecy of a son becoming a father. Jesus clearly states that he's God. And if you want to get more into that, remember Wax taught on this on February 26, 2012. Go on to our website, John 14, 1 to 9. But look on the screen. I want, I want to talk to you about something here. Um, a book that I read while I was in counseling in Colorado. It's called The Heart of a Father by Dr. Ken Canfield. I was, um, many of you know, and for those of you who don't, you can ask somebody in our church. Um, um, I went to Colorado for a year, for a year of counseling, and um, just, it, was, uh, it ended up being a wonderful experience. And um, learned a lot about myself and my distance from the Lord and reconnected to God. But one of the issues that I had in my life that, um, that when I was a young kid, my father had done, um, he did um, Korea before I was born as a Marine. Then he did two tours in Vietnam. And I was really close to my dad. I just adored my dad. I, you know, I, I was just amazed at my Marine father. I loved his uniform. You know, he would take me on helicopter rides and training things. And I was amazed that he could get there and 400 people would just stand like this whenever he walked in a room. I was just, you know, you're just blown away. You go, that's my daddy. Look what he does. You know, and it's just, you and, but when he came back from this, his second tour in Vietnam, he, um, he was very different. Um, we, did, we know now that that's post-traumatic stress disorder that our soldiers go through, a lot of people, but I didn't. But all I know is that he was very withdrawn. He wasn't as talkative. Um, he would kind of spend a lot of time by himself. Um, and he no longer, I felt like his heart was distant from me. And he really, for a very, many seasons, like, protected his emotions because I found out later as an adult just the horrors that he had seen, just the atrocity of war that most of us have never experienced. But it radically affected him. But not knowing that as a young kid, first I thought it was me. And then as I got to be an adult, and check this out, as a Christian, I realized that it wasn't me, it was him. And I got mad as a Christian. I got upset at my own father. How could he do this to me? And again, all the rationale of all of it, but there was a little boy part of me that, that longed for my dad. And I had to go through, one of the deliverances that I went through is I had to release some of the, some of the agreements that basically said, one of the agreements my father said, I will never love that man again. And I made that as a seven-year-old. I made that decision in my heart. When he came back, I said, I will never love him again. I had to break that decision. Recognize the falsehood of that. Invite the truth of God into these things. Why am I telling you this? Because our relationship with our earthly fathers radically affects our relationship and observation of our heavenly father. And reciting a lot of scripture and, and doing a lot of worship and doing things, that's wonderful. But if you've made a decision in your heart it's going to affect your view of the Father to the place where you won't even know, want to talk to about it with anybody, especially in a church like ours where everybody's really smart and knowing the Word. Why would you want to tell everybody that you're kind of dumb and having a hard time with this Scripture? He is large and in charge, but inside you're going, no, he's not. But who do you tell that to? And when I went to the counseling, one of the things I realized is just like, heck, tell it to the Father and surround yourself with people that no matter what you say, they'll love you. 
But this was the exercise that I learned in this book. And, I, and if, you, if, if you're like me and you needed to just deal with father issues, my father and I, bless his heart, he loves the Lord, and, you know, in and, and his last days we celebrate relationship. But chap, the first part of the book is called The Shape of Your Heart, and they take you through an exercise where you recognize the items of your past. Then you learn how to resolve the items of your past. And then you learn how to re-relate to your father. Now, does your father have to be present? No. Why? Well, for one thing, Abba Father is there. Pastor John, my father's dead. That's okay. Abba Father can take you through the process. Pastor John, it's, it's just we're, we're distant, and I don't know if I could ever be with again. That's okay. Abba Father can take you through this process. There's not a locked method. Oh, no, but it says this way. No, no, no. Abba Father understands. Why? Because there are parts of your heart that are closed to God because of hurt. And where does the knowledge of God begin? The light of God shines in your heart. But God, because he honors us, he will not invade those places where we say, you can't come here, God. Oh, no, no, John, that's not true because he's God. He's large and in charge. No, he's large and in charge because he's a God of self-restraint. He can break your hand. He can, he can pull his hand open any time. But a God that is all-powerful is the God that gives free will and choice. That's more powerful than somebody with big biceps. A God who says, you know what, I love you. This is the best thing, but I will let you decide what you want to do. If you let my, my light shine into your heart, I can fix that. But if you choose to close it, I will love you in the midst of it. That's Abba Father. So I read this book, and I'm just big on it because it just really helped me in part of my journey to embrace. And in my healing, I began to understand that, that although I preach a large and in charge God, in fact, he was quite small in my heart. And, and through my journey of a year, it helped me to go back to where I was. That's why David would cry in Psalm 51, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Renew a right spirit within me. And, and you can pray that, dear ones, every single day. God is never tired of your confession. God never keeps a record of your wrongs. But if you have a tainted view of Abba, because of something that you experience. You bring your childhood, and I keep repeating this for a reason. Do not let your childhood experience taint your picture of Abba Father. And if it has, ask him for help in correcting it. Amen? All right. Turn now, Genesis 14, first book of the Bible, Genesis 14. We're going to look at verses 18 to 20. And this is, this is who? The second element of God Most High. El, El Yon, God Most High. Okay? Verse 18 of chapter 14. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God Most High. There's that phrase, El, El Yon. He blessed him and said, Bless me, Abraham, of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand, and he gave him a tenth of all. Now, contextually, in this story, we know that um, Lot, Abraham's um, nephew, was kidnapped by a warring faction. Um, Lot's family and everybody, they were carried um, to a place and held hostage, and their lives were threatened. And so um, Abram got together 300 of his household, an elite fighting force, and took on a, a force of insurmountable odds. And by the power of God, 300 beat just a whole bunch of people. Well, he got back Lot and the family and all the possessions. So in Genesis 14, the neighboring warlords, they're called kings, they come to Abram, and they're very grateful that they've cleared out their enemies. And so to say, we want to express our thanks to you. And they're evil. They don't honor God, these people. But they're just grateful because they benefited from Abraham's rescue. And he said, let us pay you, bro. Let us pay you. We want to pay you. We want to give you goods. We want to give this. We're just so glad. And Abraham makes a statement. He goes, you know what? I serve the most Lord high God. I don't want any of your stuff because I don't want any part of this miracle to be tainted by you thinking because you helped me, you got a victory. 
The battle belongs to the Lord. Everything is God's. I give all of it to the Lord. And so, because of that decision, Melchizedek, some people call him a theophany or a Christophany, but either one means this is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. Where Jesus comes, because look, when you look at Melchizedek without beginning or end, study in Hebrews, and there's nobody that's without beginning or end other than God. So Melchizedek comes, and he declares the identity of God. What is he? He brings out bread and wine, a picture of Christ. And he blessed him. And then they began to introduce the three times in two verses that God most high, God most high, God most high. And, and he exalts him above all things. It reveals God's place, this, this title of God's dominion, his omniscience, that he sees and knows all things and that he's above all things. Colossians 1, 16 to 17. Just write this down, but look up on the screen because we're going to track through the Old Testament, so write this down. Look up here. For by him, Jesus, all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him, all things hold together. That's a great scripture. We're fond of saying in our church, God is large and? Okay. This is where it's rooted in. This identifier of God is God most high. Now, let's, let's challenge this a bit. If God is large and in charge, then why does evil walk the earth? If God is large and in charge... Why are some of you in here struggling with physical illness or economic downturn or you're a victim of a spouse's cruelty or of a, children, of a child's distant heart? That you have things that have happened to you that go beyond measure that you don't want to talk about, whether it's physical, emotional, or spiritual. Why then is God large and in charge? And I'm not talking about reciting it because the Pharisees recited everything, but they didn't see God. So how do we um, not be a Pharisee and we bring our frustrations about the large and in charge God to him? Did I just blaspheme? No. Dear ones, the only way he can remain large and in charge is that you come to Abba Father and say, God, you know what? I, we say that you're large and in charge, but I don't see you today. God, we say you're large and in charge, but I'm four months behind, and I've been putting in multiple applications every day into work. God, I don't see you in my finances today. Lord, you say you heal all things, but I'm 14 months into cancer. Lord, I don't see you in this part of my life today. Do you know that God can handle those prayers from you? It's the body of Christ, one another. We don't know how to handle those discussions with one another. But we, with all due respect, do not represent the heart of God. It'd be nice if we did. And I say this, dear ones, with an incredible heart, as someone who's fallen probably further than any one of you, but now that has the privilege to get up and do this again, what a wonderful thing. But my healing came through the fact that I had to come to the place where I didn't have to give that much power anymore to other people when it came to understanding how large and in charge God is. And if it meant that I needed to confess things to him and talk to him and ask questions, you know, so be it. Because you know why? My wife deserves a better husband and my kids deserve a better father and you deserve a better pastor. Amen? Amen. And if I'm going to find large and in charge through my humility, then so be it. I wrote this down because I wanted to make sure I said it right. Receive this. In Christ, I am free to never remain a victim of circumstance. Never to remain a victim. I have the keys of the kingdom and am entrusted to drive back the darkness and in the power of Christ continually embrace agape and exhibit from my heart the fruit of the Spirit. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. It's a question of whether I will or won't. Because a Christian filled with the Holy Spirit 
there's two words that no longer belong to you. I can't. Christ has made that phrase null and void in your life. I just pray you'd receive that. And that's what large and in charge means, dear one. Interesting. Go to the next scripture, Genesis 15, verses 1 and 2. Just a couple verses later. Look at the name of this one. Adonai Jehovah, the Lord God. After these things, chapter 15 of Genesis, verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Abram said, O Lord God, there it is, Adonai, what will you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house, house is Eliezer of Damascus? Now, the context of this story is interesting. We just read it. He just routed major warlords, got Lot back, refused, refused reward from earthly people. God himself has come down in the form of Melchizedek and blessed him. He's just made a radical declaration, and something happens that night when he goes to bed because the next morning he gets up, and God says, are you still afraid? And I know us people look at this and go, wow, how could he do that? He just saw God in the flesh the day before, and now he's waking up afraid. Welcome to being jars of clay. Does God say, you know, how many times I got to tell you? Do you feel the spiritual backhand of God waving all over him? No. No. And that's why I want to make a big deal about, because if the heart of you see Abba that has a spiritual backhand. Your heart, there's somewhere in your heart that's darkened to the Lord. Because I love the heart of God. He reveals the Lord God to him the next morning. The very next morning, he says, I'm the Lord God. And, and so the whole thing about it is, is Abraham has just had this victory. He's starting to realize that, he goes, God's making promises to me, and we're trying to get pregnant, and we can't. You know, we're in our 70s now, getting a little worried. <laughs> getting a little worried, you know. It's just like, you know, and, and so it's like, but he says, so, but I love it. God says, don't fear. And verse 2 is, is he chooses. He says, you're still Lord. What does that mean? You're God of my life. You're God of my potential. And you're God of my test, destiny. And he says in the midst of that, verse 2, he says, Lord, I, I acknowledge that you're all those things, so what will you give me? Because here's the problem. And I love the heart of it. The God of destiny, the God that is Lord, can handle how you work out the details. He goes, God, in case you missed it, I need a kid. And in case you missed it, I'm getting old. And God, in case you missed it, you are Lord. And so I'm at a crossroads of not understanding you right now. You need to have an Abba heart with Daddy to talk to him like this. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm really going through a radical adjustment right now because my kids are in their 20s, they're adults, they love Jesus, and they're smart. Er. And um, <laughs> so hard to say that, but it's, it's amazing. Uh, my son and I were talking, and, and he's, um, yesterday my printer went out, and, um, and so he goes, Dad, you just need an iPad. I said, I don't believe in it. And, and he, goes, he, goes, he goes, come on, Dad. I said, no, I don't. And he goes, he goes here's what you can do. And, and so we go around, and he goes, just trust me. We'll go and get the ink. He goes, no, you got to order it online. It's not going to come today. I said, son, I know what I'm doing. He says, okay. And so my son, um, this is second lieutenant, Christian boy now, Christian man. So we go around and look, and he's doing this, and he's holding his best not to, you know, say, I told you so, but I could feel it. And um, <laughs> so finally we get home, and I go, man, I don't know what to do. And he goes, he goes wow, he goes, uh, and, and I, I didn't want to email you in town. I wanted it there, uh, my personal assistant. She's so wonderful. And um, so I ended up going to one of my neighbors, you know, from HCK, because my whole neighborhood, you know, remember I passed her in a place where we got so many people saved in Kapolei that it's like, there's like, on my one street within five blocks, there's like nine families that I could just spit at, and they all love the Lord. So it's just, I said, I need a printer. And thank God they've all forgiven me, or else, you know, they would have like egged me or something. But, <laughs> and, um, but I printed it, and Jordan finally said, he goes, Dad, he goes, just get an iPad. He goes, here's what you can do. And he shows me. He goes, you can do this, this, and that. And I said, you know, I should get an iPad. He goes, great idea, Dad. And, uh, 
But the idea is, is that our Father doesn't freak out at our arguments towards him. Our Father has great ideas, and he patiently wants to reveal them to you. And we need to see him that way, because you know what, gang? We can't exist in this ever-changing world without him. God never expects you to be smart and know everything. We have the mind of Christ, but the grace and mercy of God says, you know what, ask me. Jeremiah 33, 3 is one of my most favorite scriptures. It says, ask me, and I'll show you things that you don't know, that you haven't seen. I'm like, that's a good God. I love people when they say, you missed that. And I said, really? Thank you. With not no sarcasm or, <laughs> you know, local boy looks that we put on when somebody disappoints us. Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11 is the companion scripture to this. This is the one that goes with Adonai Jehovah. It's on the screen. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And I love this because what esteems the Father what esteems Christ is not as massive. I was enjoying that for a moment. I was like, that massive bicep. Let me have my moment. I'm 50 years old. <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, Wax told me later, he goes, he goes, yeah, I miss all that stuff. I said, yeah, we kind of miss your antics too. You know, it's just like you're flexing, you know, showing us your ob. That used to be an ab, you know, and all these things, you know, because we love them so much, you know. And... Um, but the idea is, is what highlights Jesus? It's not his abs, it's not his height, it's not his bench press, it's not his intellect. It's the fact that he became a servant and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And when you read that scripture, you find that the filtering and honoring and exalting system is so different than the picture of the world. And I challenge this, even in the church, to say, is there any part of the elevation of man or woman that is, that is mixed in in a bad way, tainted by the standards of the world? Are some men better than others in the church? Are some women better than others in the church? Because we take and apply standards that God never did. I find solace in a God who is the Lord and lordship comes through humility and service and obedience. And let that mark you, okay? Next one, Genesis 17, verse 1. El Shaddai, the Almighty. How many of y'all remember Amy Grant? Oh yeah. oh, yeah. All us guys, that was the one girl we were permitted, you know, our wife said, you can have a crush on her. I said, thank you, she's so pretty. <laughs> she sang so good, and y'all are going, who's that? Just Google her, she's awesome. El Shaddai, right? That's the song she's saying, right? El Shaddai. But El Shaddai means omnipotent. Genesis 17, 1. Look at this scripture. Now, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. Now, what's the context? It's been 25 years since God has promised him, and Abraham has made declarations of God's deity. Mel Melchizedek has walked with him. He's acknowledged his lordship. He's walking in this promise, but now he's approaching 100, and he's going, oh my gosh, every day I tell people you're large and in charge, and God, you know, I'm just, I'm 99, and you know what? i am just got to have a time out and freak out with you. I mean, I don't know if I can say large and in charge tomorrow. Because I'm freaking. And so what is the Lord's response? He goes, you know what? I am large in charge. As a matter of fact, I'm going to change your name to Father of Many Nations. And, and it's like Abraham saying, excuse me, parquet, do you, are you listening? <laughs> 99, old lady, Father of Many Nations, what's going on, you know? Now, again, if you have the backhand swat thing, you know, it's just like the Bible ends right there. And Abraham died, and that was it. <laughs> but you understand, if you have the father heart of God view of the word, and you begin to see it, then you understand that we serve an incredible God who has a parent's heart. He's so not offended by the things that freak us out. Oh, my 
my gosh, that's on TV. Ah! No. Chill. Somebody gets sick, Lazarus gets sick, what does he say? Ah, I'll be there in two days. But Lord, it's okay. Oh, they're coming for you. Two swords enough. We begin to enjoy the heart of God. And, and as Abraham, the father of many nations, experienced, you know, he gets this promise. So after God calms them down, they leave. And what does he and his wife do? They say, whoa, he is large and in charge. But just in case, get my servant and impregnate her and we'll have a son. Because maybe large and in charge missed that detail. Now, none of you are like that. And of course, it's only me and everybody else that are like this, where we help God out because he forgets. <laughs> so the Lord, you know, the Lord, you know, they have this baby and they go, wow, Lord, check it out. You know, we know you missed the detail, but you know, that's why I'm a Stephen Covey kind of guy. I found it. Here is Ishmael, you know, and it's just like, and God says, no way. That's not what we're doing. And they freak out, and, and, then, and then the Lord goes, no, I want to go back. And then he says, God, and then he, he confesses at 99. He goes, you know what, Lord? I just don't think you can do this one. God loves, I just don't think you can do this one. <laughs> Lord, I, I did a recent study in biology, and this is impossible. And he goes, ha! I laugh in the face of biology. Now, you know where that's from, right? The first service didn't get it. That's from, that's from the land before time. Yeah. Littlefoot and Sarah. <laughs> I was so hurt at first service that I realized they're just really old. And Because um, I'm a parent. I'm a parent. I raised my kids on Littlefoot and Sarah. And if you don't know who that is, land before time, the first one is good. The next 17 were bad. Okay. Um, where am I? All authority, all authority. God chooses the route of physical impossibility, and it never freaks him out. And Isaac is born. Matthew 28, 18 is the companion verse. What does God say? Very simply, he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All authority. What is the context of this? He's whooped on, he's whooped on the cross. He's beat death with the, with the uh, resurrection. He's walking about, and he's about to save the entire world by what? Rising into heaven. He takes the apostles, and he says, all authority has been given to me, and then he says, go and make disciples. He doesn't say, go and just save them. He says, get them to walk in step with my heart. That's what discipleship is. It's a picture of people standing together in ranks. And when discipleship, what it is, is that, is that you walk to the cadence and the call of the one who calls it out. It's a process. It takes time. It's one that's dedicated. It can't be done in the masses. You know, everybody individually has to learn how to do things differently. So it's, it's something we can put the word out this way, but it's a, it's a willing investment of your time and your talent, of your ups and downs. It, in the process, your definition of Abba Father will be radically tested through someone else. Right? And so as we see this thing going on, all authority, God is restricted by nothing. Let's do a few more. Jehovah Jireh, Genesis 22, verse 14. Another one, if you've been a Christian as long as I have, this was a cool song once, right? Kind of a Jewish song. Hoy, hoy, you know, it's just like you kind of see this thing. Anyway, I remember that was an old joke. And for those of you who are young, you're going, what? And I go, our version of MTV, you know, we would just shine a flashlight on one another and go, look it. And then we just, anyway. Um, <laughs> Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Genesis 22, verse 14. Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. You know this story. It's a heart-stretched story. It's a story that if you don't trust Abba Father, you don't like this scripture as a parent. Because deep down, this scripture makes you afraid. We teach it. We celebrate it. But as a parent, I hated this scripture because I thought, Oh God, are one of my kids Isaac? 
And you begin to see a tainted view. But let's look at this. A papa wakes up and gets a revelation from the Lord that says, bring your son to me and sacrifice him. All the emotion is not written in the word. All we know is early the next day, he gets up. He brings real fire. He brings a real knife. He brings real sticks. He brings real heart and tension. Hebrews 11 tells us that all in his mind, he's convinced that, well, if God's large and in charge, he's going to raise him from the dead. So that gives you every heart and tension. Was he really going to do it? Yes. Did he like it? Whoa. Whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So he goes there, and he goes through the process. His son is looking at him. We don't know. We all put our stuff in there. But all I know is the fact of the story is, is as he was ready to do it, he has stopped. God says, you know what? I wanted to see your heart. Look over there. Turns his head. There's a ram caught in the bush. He kills the lamb. The lamb is the sacrifice, which is a picture of Christ. And so that story, dear ones, resonates with Abraham because he goes, when I was freaking out and I knew I had to obey, but every part of me was screaming at Abba because I could not understand his heart. All I know is he is large and in charge. I don't like what he's asking me. And what did he name him? He goes, you know, I just learned something. And hear this. He says, I will call him the Lord will provide. Why? Because God will never ask you for the life of your children. I will say that. I will say this on a stage. I will say that to the whole thing. If any of you think that God of the universe needs the blood of your son or daughter, he does not. Would you receive that? He does not. What's the cross reference? Hebrews 12. Offer your body as a living sacrifice. Do not let, and if some of you need to get on your knees after this, you need to say, God, forgive me. I invite your heart, light to shine as part of my heart because I have been afraid of you when it comes to the future of my kids. My daughter is in the army, and she, she has my bent, which means she's kolohe nuts. And, um, and, uh, but she, you know, I was a college athlete. She's, she was a college athlete. So now in the army, she's... she's um, Everything, you know, she's academically jamming. She, um, athletically, you know, she's just like making guys, you know, quiver. And she's only 5'2", but she's just a tough kid. So um, she called me the other day, and, and I, I can say just this much. So let's just say she's been offered some unique opportunities. And that freaked me out. And all of a sudden, I thought of this, and I said, oh, baby, I, I don't, you know, I think, you know, God wants you way in the back. Yeah, and I speak for him, so amen. <laughs> it lasted all but 30 seconds, and she, she and I laughed. We were very tight about these things, and she said, Dad, I need you to pray with me on this. She goes, because I sense God wants to use me to be a missionary in places where he can't go. I mean, you don't know, understand, where regular missionaries can't go, because I believe that the military is one of the greatest mission organizations, <laughs> if you let it. So yeah, I, um, I didn't want to teach this part of the aspect of God. I said, you know, okay, Lord, I, I really want to believe you with this thing, but, but he is. He doesn't demand the blood of our children. If things happen in the midst of it, it's not because he demanded it, but we live in a fallen world. Do you hear that? And will I trust God to take my heart in a journey that I don't even want to talk about? I believe I do. But see, gang, when we talk about this, this is the practical side of Abba Father. And your relationship with God as you you journey with him, be mindful of people that there's five things that you can't talk about anymore because you're a Christian. You need to trust the secrets of your heart. And I'm not condoning sin. You know my story. I don't condone that. But what I will not surround myself with people as people that say, well, we don't talk about it anymore. Well, we don't mention it. Oh, he's large in charge. I, I just, you know, I, I'm not going to talk about it. Okay, well, let me find another human that is struggling like me because I want him to be large and in charge. In the very part of my heart where his light is shining, I don't know how to open up my heart unless God helps me to open up my heart so that I can be in agreement. Do you receive that? you understand that? That's our interaction with Abba Father, right? So when we do this, so 
We want to be overcome with relief and awe. We want to be surprised like an Abraham and say, wow, I never knew God was like that. I'm released because I'm so glad I thought and hoped you were like that. But when it got real personal, I didn't know if you really were like that. It's always easier, dear ones, when someone else has the story. But when it's your story, all those scriptures come to light. And God isn't going, what? You don't believe me. <laughs> right? And if you have that view, again, check, you know, check that view with God. What does John 6 say? And we're getting close to ending. Um, all my notes are on the web. I actually have 15 traits of God from the Old Testament. Um, when the staff saw this, they go, oh my gosh. And I said, don't worry about it because um, they're wonderful things that you can study. You can look at them. My notes are very involved for you so you can download them, okay? Jason, make sure I don't speak with forked tongue that they're on the website by tomorrow, okay? <laughs> and, um, but Genesis, John 6, what does it say? Verse 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger and he who believes in me shall not thirst. In John 6, God feeds the multitude physical need, right? Jehovah Jireh, he provides physical need. In this latter part of it, he provides a word picture of him being um, the bread of life towards salvation. He provides spiritual need. I wrote this down because I want to make sure I said it right. Jehovah Jireh provides physically and spiritually, okay? Understand that. Understanding that we are wise to prioritize our spiritual need when coming to him, but there is never a need for hesitation. Hear this. Or fear requesting and expecting his provision in physical or material, economic or vocational ways. Let me check my time. Okay, good. Jeremy, my youngest, okay, who's now 20, one, and um, I remember once uh, we were at one of the air shows or something. I don't know if it was that I had pulled all the kids out of school because a carrier was at Pearl Harbor. Whenever a carrier came in, that was like free day um, because I knew that um, my kids were fascinated with the air, and um, I believe as a parent, whenever you discover your kid's dream, find a way to pour gas on it and just, just ignite it because then they see how large and in charge God is ignite your kids dreams especially as and then watch what god does with it but just love on it so we went we did something and so jordan is is asking so i go okay that's an f-18 you can tell by the the angle of the the back fins and the the wings are fixed versus f-14 and i'm explaining this and all of a sudden and because my mother or father took a video of this remember video you know big cameras and so and so we're watching it again because we still got it. We're transferred over to a DVD. And, and um, I'm watching this thing, and I'm laughing, laughing, laughing because my three-year-old, you hear this high-piercing voice in the midst of me explaining this. You hear this, where's the U.S. Navy? <laughs> and then I'm looking at this. I go, is that Jerry's voice? I go, wow, he really had a high voice back then. You know, we're laughing, you know, because now he talks like this, you know. And so... But what amazed me is I'm explaining, I'm explaining aircraft configurations, and okay, that's a KC-135, and that's this, and that's an AWACS, and, you, and all of a sudden you hear it repeated, where's the U.S. Navy? And, and, I'm, and I'm going, not now. And it's just like, and I keep going, and we're doing this, and about 20 minutes in, Jerry's must have said this like 15 times already. <laughs> And I'm so oblivious to it. But you can see in the camera, because um, I guess it's my dad. He must be nervous that he's capturing me, ignoring my littlest son. <laughs> if some agency is going to go, tell him where the U.S. Navy is, you know? And it's like, and so, anyway, um, tell him where the U.S. Navy is, gentler. And so, um, Anyway, so on the camera, there's a dynamic where pretty soon, Brenna's going, John, tell him where the U.S. Navy is. And, and even Jordan's going, Dad, tell him where the U.S. Navy is. <laughs> you know, and, and I'm just like into my thing. And finally, um, I, you know, so uh, we go off. And I remember um, later, because Jeremy told me, because I saw it, I go, I go, son, did I ever tell you where the U.S. Navy was? And he goes, yeah. He goes, uh, and again, it's amazing you know, he was three, but they remember it through the kids and everything else. And this is how the story goes. Um, I told him that, um, I told him where the U.S. Navy was, and, and it was, you know, about the ships. And I didn't understand, and I just discovered this a couple years ago, that Jerry was asking where Old Navy was. <laughs> he 
he called Old Navy U.S. Navy. That's what he believed it was. <laughs> and um, so I'm sitting here trying to do this. Why do I say this? Why do I say this? You know, and uh, there's, there's things like that. There's things on tape that I wish we didn't catch. This one was funny, but, you know, can you imagine catching those moments where you just utterly did not understand the voice of your child? And because you didn't understand, you responded in inappropriate ways. Some of you don't need tapes like that, do you? You have them. And when I look at this aspect of the father in the midst of what's going on in this very emotional passage, we're going to end here. I love this passage because God can handle the spectrum of Abraham's emotions, not to mention the long discussions he's going to have. We never know what Abraham and Sarah talked about after this. But you ladies, can you imagine hearing about this story from your husband? Oh, honey, funny thing happened on the way to the sacrifice. <laughs> uh, you, you all know this. Guys, you know this. You tell a story to your wife and it's all better, but you know what? Get prepared. You know, you're going to be on the couch for like two weeks. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's just the emotion of it and everything that goes on and all that happens and everything else. Is he large and in charge of those things? But why I ask, tell you this is because um, you can ask for anything. You can ask where the U.S. Navy is, even if you have the question wrong. And God will not scold you. He will not get down on you. Even if cameras are going, the whole world thinks one way and another. You know what? Don't be afraid to ask for money. Don't be afraid to ask for a job. Well, I don't want to give to get. You know what? Let the Father, who is Abba and perfect, sort through the hard intentions. Don't poll everybody and say, is this the right thing to pray? 1 Corinthians 2, no one knows the heart of a man except that man. Stop giving away your Abba connections to other people. Why? Because he loves you enough, he will get you. And anytime there's a backhand involved in the voice of God or a threat or a punt or I'm, you're out of my life, that is not the heart of God. He lives to draw near to you. Right? Romans 8, and I want to end here. Look in your Bibles. Amen. There's, um, I'm looking at the notes here. There are nine more traits on the notes. Enjoy them. I think um, in first service, I got through nine of them. This one, we only got through five of them. That's okay. That's okay. Well, look at Romans 8. Verses 15 to 17. Romans in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Verse 15. For you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Daddy, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if, we, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. My prayer, dear ones, is as you leave church today and all week, that, that you would um, follow the excitement and relief possibilities you have in pursuing the Abba Father, heart of God. Know that the enemy will want to bring in lies and deceit and deception to steal that part of you. Abba Father wants to shine the light of his presence, right? We said through the face of Christ, it goes into your heart, which brings knowledge to your head. And anytime the devil can convince you, how does he do that? Through unforgiveness, through bitterness, through rationalize, through a vow that says, I will never let that happen again. But mostly just unforgiveness then he's got you Abba Father wants to show these things to you I'm blessed in my life now you know that in this, in this side of, of, of my fall and, and salvation and year three of doing this and being with you all um, to bring a papa's heart to you to show you pictures of three adult children that have weathered tragedy but because Bern and I parented well and we continue to because believing that God is large and in charge means that we engage in all these things. My wife and I don't have to have all the answers. And you know what we tell our kids? They don't have to have all the answers either. Because he does. 
and he wants to be found by you. He longs to answer you. He is wonderfully patient with you. He never gives up on you. He knows your language. He knows the, the subtle nuances of your questions. He understands when you're so emotional that when you quit, you don't really mean it. He doesn't have a tape. He doesn't have a sense of finality with you. He's a papa. He's a daddy. He is crazy, crazy in love with you. He doesn't use any measures of the world in looking at you. And all, the, all of this, to be a daddy, it doesn't deter from his omniscience, his omnipotence, his power, his just, his lordship, his ability to provide. He longs to, and, but he covers it all by saying, just call me daddy. And the great gift that we as preachers get to give you is, is to constantly disarm any part of us that want to want to elevate ourselves or do it or make it such an elite thing. He loves you, gang. He loves you. It's not a mystery. He loves you. He loves you so much. Celebrate that. Do not give in to a spirit of fear. Approach him, take a running jump, leap into his lap, trust him that he catches you. He will tickle you and noogie your head to death because he loves you. He loves you. Don't let any part of it Nothing can separate you from the love of God. I didn't make that up. That's Romans 8. He separates your sin as far as the east is from the west. He is the everlasting daddy. You never graduate to a place where you grow up and he looks at you differently. Isn't that wonderful? No matter how old you, how old you are, you are his child. The everlasting father. So Lord, as we come to you and we look at the things that you have for us, Father, we're so grateful that you present a view through your word, Lord, that at times is totally different than how we experience you. God, than how we see you. You are the everlasting Abba Daddy. And Lord, calling you Daddy does not demean or deter all the other aspects of who you are, Lord God. You're the creator of the universe. You're huge, God. You're everywhere. You know stuff. But God, what you encourage your children more than anything else, Father, is that we can take a moment in our relationship with you and go, wow, that's my dad. That's my dad. Wow, that's my dad. Wow, you're my dad. So, Father, just bring healing to us in our view of you, Lord, because you love us, Lord, and you long for us to love you back, Lord, and to understand you. Forgive us in our moments of fear of you, for our moments of preconceived notions about you, Lord God. Father, help us when we recite things that are truthful. You are large and in charge, Lord God. But, Father, that you understand while we're reciting that there's three or four parts of our heart that go, God, but not here. And, Lord, you're not mad at us. You never condone our sin, Lord, but you never write us off. So, Abba, Father, we invite you, Lord, shine your light. Shine your light into our hearts, Lord, to bring knowledge. Thank you, God. Thank you for your heart. And Father, on this side of heaven, all of us who have the privilege of being fathers, Father, thank you that it's never too late. Thank you for your goodness and grace and mercy. Father, I, your word says that you will heal the relationships between fathers and children and children and fathers. That's your heart. Lord, all of us are a son and daughter too, Lord. And help us to put our parents in perspective, Lord Jesus. Thank you, God, for showing me stuff. Thank you, Lord, for allowing me the privilege, Lord, of enjoying my dad while he and I are still on this side of heaven, Lord God. Father, for the release and relief I feel in knowing that, you know what? It wasn't his fault. And it wasn't mine either. 
We don't want to be victims of the world stuff, Lord God. We're tired of that. We're tired of being victims. Set me free, oh God. Thank you, Lord. If you're here this morning, I would love to introduce you to my daddy. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. He loves you so much. The Bible says that he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for your sins and to rise from the dead. He's closer than your breath. He stands at the door of your heart and knocks right now. If you hear the voice of God, dear one, this morning, and you would like to know Jesus personally, all you have to do is invite him into your heart. I'm going to pray out loud in a moment. You can pray quietly in your heart. But you know what? The Bible says if you confess Jesus before men, that, that he'll confess you before the Father. So I'm not going to have you stand up or make a speech or anything. But if you'd like Jesus, enjoy the freedom. Would you just raise your hand? And, and, and just declare, I want Jesus in my heart, and I'm going to pray for you. If that's your desire, raise your hand right now. Is anybody? Where? Right on. That's your heart? Good. Good. Anybody else? Jesus, I want your heart. I got you back there. Good for you. Good, 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 good. Anybody else? My heart for you, Lord. My heart for you. I got you, bro. Good. All right, good. Good, good, good. Celebrate. We celebrate Jesus here. Good. All right. If you're watching on, on the webcast, then you know what, or on TV, however this is, you know, and, and months may have gone by in this, but you know what? You declare your heart to Christ. He stands right here. And the privilege of the Lord is saying like this, and I go, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. So let's do that now. All of you that raised your hand, hitchhike off of this prayer. Some of y'all just, you know what, you need to dedicate your heart and just say, Abba, Father. But Lord, we come to you now, Lord. And Daddy, we are grateful, Abba, Father, for who you are. And there's a tenderness about you that I did not know. But God, you saw me today. You hear me today. And you found a way to reach me, Lord, and, and you know me. So thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for my sins. Teach me what it means that you physically rose from the dead. But I declare from my heart, Jesus, you are Lord. And I invite you now to be Lord of my life. I surrender myself to you. God, bring people into my life that can teach me and disciple me. Lord, um, bless me, Lord, with fresh eyes that I look at your word. And now, Lord, I pray, seal these new believers in Jesus' name as they now are indwelt by your presence, Lord. Father, help them to taste and see that you are good. Protect their minds and hearts, Lord God. Angel of the Lord, I pray now that you encamp around these new ones that fear you. Thank you, Lord, that your angels rejoice in heaven over this moment, Lord God. And God, more than anything else, your word says nothing can separate them from your love. Nothing can. We open our hearts to you, Abba. We give you thanks and honor. In Jesus' name, amen.